So today we're going to talk about what to look for when buying a used GPU. And we have a couple of examples here. This has come about because like the GPU cleaning video we did recently, it's become evident that a lot of people are forced to buy used. And hopefully you can get a good deal on something. But there's an important distinction to be drawn between getting a good deal on something and getting something that doesn't work but was priced in a good way. And we do have one viewer who got neither of those things, paid $700, they're telling us, for an RX 580, which, by the way, was a $200 to $250 card originally, and it doesn't even work. So what we're going to do today is go over a couple of the most common failure modes for a second-hand video card. It is actually OK to buy a second-hand card. They can withstand a lot of use. But there are some key identifiers to figuring out when a card might be compromised and you should maybe pass on the purchase. And that's what we're going to help with. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is what we've been using for years to manage our own Gamers Nexus store, and we've been incredibly happy with the choice. Squarespace makes e-commerce easy for those interested in starting stores, but it also has powerful tools to build all types of websites. Photo galleries for photographers, resume and portfolio sites, and small business sites are all easily done through Squarespace. Having built a lot of client websites the old way before running GN full-time, we can easily recommend Squarespace as a powerful, fast solution. Go to squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So we already did the video on cleaning a video card and what kind of benefit that can have when you clean out an older card, when you try to bring some life back to something you've had for a while. But in this one, we're focused more on, uh, again, the things to look for in a failure. So as we get into this, here's a list of some of the most common or most important failures that we've encountered with some of the rare ones in here too. This is what we're going to go through today. And our GPU testing at this point dates back probably over a decade. We have shelves of dozens and dozens of cards. And at some point, we've seen one of these issues on the cards. And so that's why they're on the list. Common ones include things like cracked or bad thermal paste, which you're not going to see until you maybe test it thermally or open it up. You'll also see bad dust buildup or grime and thermal pads and the heat sink and fan. And even on the thermal pads, as long as you can see into the back plate, there's a good chance that you see any grime buildup before you buy the cart. So that's something that's fixable and uh, is one of the more common issues. You might also run into memory artifacting, GPU sag causing separation of the cooler, warping or bending of the PCB, particularly if it has had a water block or has one now. Uh, uncommonly or rarely, you'll get the Space Invaders artifacting, GPU core frequency locking, like if there's a short circuit and it's going into safety mode, uh, or if someone overly shorts the shunt resistors, you might have the GPU core stuck from a short from the 20 pin connector on the 20 series cards. There could also be blown MOSFETs, inductors, or caps, broken tamper seals, potentially indicating a bigger problem. Tamper seal itself doesn't matter. Missing screws, particularly in the I.O. area where they often strip, and other general physical damage to the card. So that's what we're going to go through. So this one's got a couple of obvious problems, like this, the sawdust and the rust. And we'll talk more about that. Missing screws also. And those are, are three things you could look for. But the least uh, common but most catastrophic type of failure is the one that you can't see before you buy the card. So there's a couple things to think about. When buying a used video card, there's obviously the human factors question. So human factors would be stuff that we're not really going to go into today, but it's probably the most important. It's your judge of their character. Does the person seem like they're legitimate or like they're going to disappear as soon as you buy it, delete their burner number if you bought it locally, and then the card's not going to work? So there's judge of character. There's how legitimate or valid does the listing on eBay or wherever look. And then the pricing versus what you're getting, does that make sense? But that's all sort of social stuff, and we're not going to talk with that. Hopefully, you've got some skills there already. For the technical stuff, video card failures, if you're buying locally, like Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist, you're probably going to have a better chance of finding someone with a soul uh, who is not going to completely gouge you if you can meet them in person. Maybe they'll feel bad enough to sell you the card for a price that's reasonable instead of selling you a GTX 1060 for the MSRP in 2016 today. But if you have to overpay for a card, uh, at least doing it locally, you will be able to force the person into a scenario where you can test it and make sure it works before you buy it. And if you can test it, the reason that's important, we can show with this. This is an RTX 3080. It's still a new card, but it has a key problem, which is that this specific RTX 3080 fails in boot during or just before post when it's trying to initialize vBIOS. This is an issue that 
is not visible at all physically. You, you will not be able to see this issue on the card. There are no burn marks. There's nothing that looks wrong at all. As soon as you socket it, the system won't turn on. We'll show that in a little bit and show you what that error looks like. This card has a different issue, but it's a very common failure. This one is a card that is artifacting, and it's actually it's pretty old. What was this? <laughs> That's some, what, what was this thing? Uh, 560 Ti, I think. This looks like a 560 Ti. So this one's got an issue that we were going to use this card for the cleaning video that we did previously. We couldn't because it artifacts. So we'll show you what artifacting looks like. Now, there's also the Space Invaders issue. The Space Invaders issue was a special type of artifacting that was related to the RTX 20 series. And we think it's memory. That was later resolved. There's another issue related to the 20 series as well. And we'll show some old footage of this happening. But with our Titan V and at least one other card, I want to say an RTX 2080 Ti, we had issues where the frequency was locked at 1300 or so megahertz. So like we showed in that set of videos, and we'll bring them back up again, the problem was the card looks like it's running fine. And it actually does boost into 3D clocks, sort of. But it gets stuck at a low frequency, like 500, 600 megahertz below where it should be. And the reasoning for that specific failure on the 20 series cards that use the 20 pin connector over on the right side of the PCB, this is a 1080 Ti, but it was on the right side of the PCB, and it was for the fans on the 20 series. It was part of the reference design and part of the FE design as well. And what it would do is, in installation, uh, if they bridged two of the pins by crushing them when installing the header, it would force the card into a form of safety mode and lock the frequencies. This isn't something we discovered until much later when an engineer told us off record. So. Uh, another, that's another type of failure. And the way to look for these types of failures is basically to use some software. So let's do a couple demos. So here's what we're going to do. Gonna, gonna. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through the highest priority or severity issues one by one and uh, teach some stuff that might be basic to some of you. But first thing, if you can test the card either in person or maybe you've purchased it on eBay, you have some form of seller or buyer protection rather. And with buyer protection, you might have a day or two you can run some validation tests and, and then choose to send it back if it's not working. If at some point you can get the card in a system within a window where you can return it. The basic things that I would do to validate it works would be to look at the clock boosting behavior, the temperatures to some extent. You can fix that a little bit though. And uh, just overall make sure the card is running as you would expect. Because there are times it can run but there might be issues later down the line. So first thing, GPU-Z is free software. Highly recommend it. It's on Tech Power Up, and uh, Wizard, the developer of it, does great work. So uh, GPU clock is the thing you want to look at. We're not running anything. This is normal. This number will be in the, the maybe 100 to 300 range if it's stuck in 2D clocks uh, because of someone overzealously shorting shunts or something. But otherwise, this is normal on desktop. The other numbers you'll look at will be eventually GPU temperature, not a whole lot of point looking at them right now in idle, but under load, they'll become important. And then what we're going to do is use some software. So in this case, I'm going to run just a benchmark application. We'll use Superposition. But you could use your favorite game or something, too, as long as it's sufficiently demanding and it's not just uh, two-dimensional rendering. OK, so with some 3D application running in the background, this one's particularly stressful. But the goal is going to be looking at the frequency. Sorry, it's hard to read here, but we'll look at GPZ in a moment. And we can show some of our frequency over time plots in the past as well. But either way, frequency is over 1900 megahertz here. Look into the particular card you're buying. It will change generation to generation. There's no wide net we can cast. Sometimes you're looking at 2400 megahertz uh, for sort of the peak range. Sometimes you're looking at maybe 1400. So either way, look up the card specifically, or the GPU specifically you're buying, and make sure the frequency is somewhere in the range that it should be. Memory is m gonna be fixed on basically everything. That's what it does. Uh, temperature here, I, I wouldn't really use the superposition readout, but it's gonna be the same thing as what GPU-Z is reading. And uh, you're gonna make sure utilization is something high as well, otherwise you're judging the frequency on the wrong scenario. So let's close this application. All we really cared about was the frequency number. And if the GPZ was open in the background, you can save to a log file as well. But you can see we were in the 1900s the whole time. So this card is doing well and behaving as it should. The temperature, if you wanted to look at it, so a lot of people will spot check temperature. Never do this as a reviewer. As a consumer, 
if you're going to spot check temperature, at least let the thing run for about 20 minutes first for it to hit steady state. Uh, we were just demoing quickly. But generally speaking, the temperature is going to change card to card. Uh, it's going to change based on the age and everything else. And it's contingent on how much power it's pulling. But uh, there are certain safeties. And once you're above 90C on like non-new Radeon cards, then maybe it's time to take the thing apart and repaste it. But if it's not absolutely throttling, which would be indicated by the way in GPZ, then you're mostly fine. And uh, perf cap reason would tell you that. So it'll say therm, where it says power right now, it would say T-H-E-R-M if it's thermally throttling. And that's true for memory throttling as well on cards that support that readout. So that shows the really super basics of the software. We use this software pretty much every day, especially when doing GP reviews. There's a lot more to it than this. And when doing reviews, there's a ton more control and care that has to be applied to getting those numbers. But for just making sure the thing you just bought is doing what it should be, that approach is fine. And obviously, you'll want to maybe play some games for a while, too, to really find any issues. Now, what we'd like to show next is artifacting. This one, we, we do have a card that artifacts. This is a somewhat common, but not super common problem. Uh, however, it is common enough that people in the audience, there's, there's a good amount of you who have likely seen artifacting before. So let's demonstrate what that looks like for those who might not know. OK, so for this one, we had to switch display connectors. But it brings me to another point, which is that uh, some stuff you can look at on used cards, obviously, is physical damage. We'll talk about more of that a little bit later. We're starting with sort of the GPU side, software side of stuff. But uh, this card, for example, looks like perhaps Linus handled it before we got it. But if you look for physical damage like this, it might not mean that the card itself is bad. You can certainly drop video cards and have them still work fine. But it could be indicative of a bigger problem. OK, so this one should give us artifacts as soon as I start installing drivers. I was mistaken. We have, we have so many older GPUs. Uh, the one we wanted was the HD6870, which I've plugged in now. And this one will artifact. We'll show you what to look for. We're just looking for the HD6870 drivers. And I found a flaw. It is the 6000 series, and it is the 6800 series, but that is not it. Names that strike again. Ah, oh, yes, this makes sense. This is perfectly logical. So here's the example of artifacting that we're talking about. This can happen from things like bad memory on the card or just from a bad memory overclock. You could try to manually tune down the memory below stock and see if that helps. And it sometimes does, depending on how aggressive the manufacturer was at launch. But it's mostly indicative of a problem that isn't necessarily solvable. Doing a DDU driver clean and reinstall can sometimes help, but the problem might come back. Switching rear I.O. to a different port can help as well if there's an issue with just that one output. And if none of these things fix the artifacting, and if downclocking the memory doesn't help by, say, 50 to 100 megahertz, it might be best to seek just a return and a refund on the card, or don't buy it if you're in front of the person and you have that luxury. A somewhat common issue might be GPU sag. This happens naturally, but it can get exaggerated with time. GPU sag is when the video card starts to droop on the far side and can be countered with a support beam, included in some cases, actually. This is sometimes indicative of a loose backplate or loose mounting at the PCIe slot. It's not necessarily the card's fault. And we actually tested GPU sag a few years ago for thermals and got some good shots of it then. But if buying used, the larger concern is one where the cooler begins to separate from the PCB components. So your thermal pad might be stuck to the MOSFETs, but the cooler could be pulling away from the thermal pad on the far side. You might see this in the sale photos of the video card, in which case you saved some time. You can plan to either ignore GPU sag, like if it's not too extreme, or fix it with a makeshift support of some kind. Those of you with 3D printers might be best equipped for this, although there are products available to support GPUs. We've used just simple foam blocks in the past. For physical hardware problems, the obvious ones are easy. If you see a broken tamper seal, it's not necessarily a sign of something bad, but it does mean that the user likely opened it at some point. They might claim they repasted it, and if they're being honest, it means they probably maintained the card well, and this is a good thing. The one point of concern is if they're trying to sell it because they didn't know what they were doing and broke the card in the process of opening it. So try to test it before buying. If it's missing screws as well, the same thing applies. Those screws don't necessarily matter, 
but it's an indicator of a larger issue, which is attention to detail and reassembly. You can also look for dust buildup, like in our previous video, or like in the case of this sawdust encrusted video card. Rust is another indicator that it was in a highly humid environment or exposed to water. And for internals, you likely won't be repasting until you at least know it works well enough to keep. And we would strongly recommend, if you're buying a used GPU, that you don't open the card until you're fairly certain that you're keeping it. Because once you open it, it gives the seller an avenue to accuse you of breaking it, even if it was already broken. We showed repacing in our previous video and showed one card from 11 years ago that had the silk screen paste basically fused with the aluminum heatsink. So we had to chip it off and replace it. It's generally just good maintenance to keep the paste somewhat fresh every few years anyway, but we'll leave that to our previous video. If you see excessive dust buildup or see that thermal pads are covered in filtered dirt, it's a good indicator that you can easily fix what the user might not have been able to. If they claim that the card's been overheating, you take one look at it and see it's jammed with dust, well, maybe you can save some money, buy something that the user is not willing to fix, and fix it yourself. Other problems might include blown MOSFETs or capacitors or missing capacitors. The cylindrical style capacitors are normally pretty easy to identify for failures because you'll see them bulging with time. Uh, you can also see one of the legs sort of pulled out. MOSFETs or inductors will have burn marks if they're messed up, but it's unlikely you'll find these problems because it would involve opening the card. Uh, however, if you plug the card in and it's failing to post, if red lights appear at the PCIe connectors for those cards that do have LEDs there, that would be an indicator that it may be an issue you can't really easily fix. And if you can, you're probably not watching this video. As for capacitors, missing something like an MLCC here and there isn't going to ruin the card. They still work fine, but it's not ideal, obviously. We'd also recommend keeping an eye out for warped PCBs. This isn't necessarily related to GPU sag, but it can be related to water block installation or from someone applying new thermal pads to the cooler that is already on there and using the wrong size. Thermal pads have to be exactly the right size down to half millimeters normally. Otherwise, the PCB will bow from the cooler applying too much pressure in a particular spot. So as long as the card still works, this can be easily fixed by just buying the right size pads. Finally, fans are a big one. No spin fans are common these days. So a fan twitching, like EVGA's 1060 uh, that we recently looked at, or sitting idle doesn't mean it's broken. It's probably a feature. If it remains stationary under heavy gaming loads, though, there might be a problem. It could be as simple as the fan header is not connected or is broken, like if they ripped it out of the socket, if they disassembled it, uh, or it could be that the fans have died. You might also find fans with broken blades, and this is something to pay close attention to when buying. Just if it looks like it's missing one, then there's a problem. Fans are very easy to replace, fortunately, so if that's the only problem with the card, it's a great project to pursue for a lower price. Just take the fan out, identify the model on the back of it, and buy a new one online. Most take a few minutes to replace. We have a few case fans with broken blades that we can use as examples here. So stress fractures can form with age on fans and with long-term use. It's more common with larger fans, though, than with GPU fans. And as those fractures form, blades will normally split at the hub. And you can typically see this stress fracture forming before the blade explodes off of the fan. There is one more thing that can be done, and that's maybe applying new lubricant to the fan's bearings. Depends on the type of bearing. Depends on if they're actually the problem, but if you hear squealing from the fans when you turn the card on, then normally this will fix it, but replacing the fan would also work. So that's going to be it for the what to look out for with buying a used GPU. There's a lot of basic stuff, and there's a lot of stuff we can't really teach, like just being aware of how the person's listing kind of sounds when you read it, and being aware of where they're located, so if you're not buying locally, and you're competing with the global market, you're more likely to pay a higher price right now. And also, if you're buying on somewhere like eBay, pay attention to where it's shipping from because there's certain areas based on where you are that it might be harder to get a refund or pursue a return or a replacement uh, contingent on where they are relative to you. So just pay attention to things like that and the social side of stuff we're not going to talk about. There's, just, there's certain things that aren't, uh, aren't for this video. But those are the main items from a technical perspective of what to look for. And obviously, there's plenty more to talk about. Uh, crypto mining might be one. A lot of people ask if a card has been used for mining, is that a bad thing? Depends. If it's a, we'll call them a, a professional mining operation, then it's possible, if it wasn't in an overly hot warehouse, that the card is potentially in better shape than it would be if it were in the average gamer's computer. 
uh, because in theory, they're running it at a reduced power load. It might have a modded BIOS on it. And if that's the case, you can go to Tech Power Up and try to grab one for the same card you bought and replace the BIOS that's on there. But it's possible it's in better shape, except for if it's in an overly hot warehouse where it's been burning up for years and years. And on the topic of vBIOS, we did have that 13080 that doesn't boot. The way to identify that, you plug it in, you push the power button, and you get a postcode on the board. If the board has a seven segment display, awesome, look up the code. Oftentimes it'll come back as a VGA vBIOS failed to initialize, typically how the error is described in the manuals. Uh, or you might get a post beep and you can look up what that beep code means. It exists as well in, in beep format. But that's it for this one. Hopefully this helps some of you. Uh, you can check out our previous video on how to clean a video card once you've bought it if you want to learn about that or keep your current card going. We have a lot of revisits for older video cards as well, where you can see how they perform today with benchmarks versus modern cards and other old cards. Or you can go to store.cameraxis.net if you'd like to buy something like one of our teardown toolkits, specially made for video cards, works with most of them on the market, or one of our mouse mats or other items. Thank you for watching. Check back for more, and we'll see you all next time.